the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Corpodian. Welcome back to Unleash Success. This is your host, Corey Corpodian. Today, guys, I'm really honored to be here to interview a true inspiration and entrepreneur, Dr. Sam Bakhtiar. He's the founder of Transformation Center, The Camp. It's helped over thousands of people get in shape and build confidence in their own life. Nationwide, you can see these, The Camp Transformation Centers all over the country. And Sam actually started his passion for fitness as a bodybuilder, winning over 23 titles. He's never letting himself settle for less. He started the One Percenter podcast, the One Percent Nutrition Supplement line, and he's breaking down his secrets of success today with us. Sam, thanks for coming on the show. Bro, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for having me. Thank you. One thing I, I didn't even mention in there is that you are actually a refugee from Iran. Correct. And you immigrated it at 11 years old. Correct. And what was it like growing up in this country, you know, starting off as, you know, with this dream of being an entrepreneur, the American dream? Mm -hmm. For you, what was it like coming over when you first started and, you know, not being able to speak the language even? You know, we came here for one thing and one thing only, for freedom. You know, we know, in an old country, we were getting bombed by Saddam Hussein every, every day, every night. Every night you have, you know, you know uh, lights go out, sirens, blackouts, and planes flying over, dropping bombs. So we came to America at 11 years old when I was 11, me and my single mom with $500 in the luggage. And I tell you, the war had nothing on coming to America as far as how, how hard it was. You know, we came to America. We thought, we're, I mean, I was thinking we we're gonna to go to Beverly Hills because I was watching all these shows on, on TV about America and they were portraying like, you know, you know everybody has mansions and Bentleys and, and so Olympic sized swimming pools and, and great life, but they didn't show the hood, the other side of America. And we unfortunately came to a little town called Sharon, Pennsylvania, which is in the middle of nowhere, about an hour out, outside of Pittsburgh, in a very depressed town where all the steel mills have shut down and it was 1985, middle of crack cocaine epidemic. And it was full of, you know, drug dealers, prostitutes, um, you know, uh, it, it, it was just bad. So my first impression of America, I was expecting Beverly Hills, but I went to the, the, one of the worst neighborhoods that I've ever seen to date. To date. Wow. And I, I, was, I was totally shocked. But what, that was nothing until I came to school. Because I went to school I was the only minority in school. There was black people, there was white people, and they were like, what the hell is you? Exactly, what is you? Was so, I remember somebody said, what is you? You're not black, you're not white, what are you? I went, I went to school, I didn't have the same clothes that everybody else had, not the same haircut, you know, I, you know, I didn't speak the language, and it, it, it was tough, you know, thinking about, you know, at that age, you're preteen, people are calling you names, you know, you're getting bullied, you know, you're getting, you know, it, it was tough. It was, it, the war had nothing to do with that shock of coming to a new country. Wow. I mean, I, just the, the thought of being bombed as a child, I, I, traumatizing, but the fact that coming to a new country and living in one of the toughest areas that you've ever seen, I mean, like, I, I'm surprised, a war-ridden country, and then this was actually harder to, to adjust. You, you know, when I was at war, when you are born... When the, I was three years old when the war started. So to me, that was normal. Uh -huh. To me, that was normal. Again, you know, getting bombed on every night was something like, okay, something we do, it's like a game. Oh, the sirens are in. Go behind the stairs, go underneath the house, and hopefully you don't get bombed on. I didn't personally see, with my own eyes, people dying. I didn't personally see anywhere. I, we just saw it on the news, and we, saw, we heard the noise, and we saw the planes flying over, and we saw the anti-air missiles, but I never see personally. So maybe that, that, was, that was one, because if I would've saw that, maybe that would've been different. But seeing it and hearing it was a reality. But coming to America and experiencing you know, discrimination, experiencing name calling, experiencing being bullied, and not fitting in, because at, 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 as humans, we want to fit in. We want to, you know, hey, I'm black, I'm white, oh, I like rap music, oh, I like rap, rock music, you know, I like cars. I, whatever you're into, you want to belong to a certain group. It's one of the primary human needs. And when I came to America, I didn't belong. 
I, I love the fact that you came to America, didn't speak the language, faced adversity, and you know, still were able to create all of this with your life. Yeah. And we're sitting in your garage with a Lamborghini right behind us, and this beautiful home. And thank you for having us over here. It's just like, but this is the American dream. And where did that journey of entrepreneurship, where, where was that like fire that started for you as when you were working that you were like, you know what, I wanna build that. I wanna create that. Yeah, so, so you know, I, you know, I wish I could have told you oh, when I was 10 years old, when I was nine years old, you know, I was an entrepreneur and I wasn't. I didn't have an entrepreneur mentality. Growing up as a Middle Eastern with a Middle Eastern mom, my mom said you can only be three things in life if you want to be successful, doctor, lawyer, or engineer. You know, so, and she, and she walked away and she said, I prefer you become a doctor. So this whole life, like, I was given what I was going to be. I, I wasn't given a choice to, hey, you, you know what, find your passion, do what you love to do. You know, I was taught that if you dress in a suit and tie, you're automatically successful. You know, and that, so, so when I was going to school, I knew that I had to go to university and become a doctor. You know, when I came to, you know, the United States and I went to school, I wanted to play you know, soccer. They didn't have a soccer team back then oh. in, in the middle of nowhere America. Soccer is popular now, but in 1985, you know, in the middle of nowhere America, it was, you know, like I said, it was baseball, football, and basketball. So since I didn't have my favorite sport, I went to the boys club every day and I, I saw these guys that looked like Arnold and Sylvester Stallone back then. And I'm like, man, I want to look like that. So I started lifting. And that was the beginning of what I wanted to do the rest of my life. Because with lifting, not only I love what it did for me on the outside, but I love what it did for me on the inside when it comes to self-esteem, self-worth, confidence, you know, energy, and believing in yourself. I love that. You know, I was reading about the camp, the entire uh, business that you created, and you're not just inspiring people to lose weight, you're inspiring their mental fitness as well, which is something that I believe so strongly in and, and creating that. As a young kid, did you think that maybe you know, I know I've heard that you were bullied a little bit. I was. You know? I, got bu I was bullied. I was beat up. Was that kind of the inspiration to start like lifting, getting stronger, getting bigger? Kind of. I mean, I mean, I mean, part of it. Absolutely. Part of it. You know, I, I, you know, who wants to be pushed around? Who wants to be called names? Who wants to be beat up? You know, so that part of that reason is for me, I, had, I wanted to make myself stronger. Where does that drive come from, though, where it says, all right, I'm going to do working out. I'm going to start a business to I want to be part of the one percent to I'm going to go win 23 titles. So to me, I was always taught by my mom that if I want, I can become anything that I want as long as I was willing to work. I was willing as long as I was willing to work hard. So work hard was always still in me as a single mom. My mom had a few jobs just to be able to make ends meet and, and, and to care of myself. And look, we all came to America for an opportunity. Now, how the hell are you in this country? All these opportunities are in front of you, and you're sitting home and Netflixing. You know what I mean? I, I just don't understand, I understand that mentality, and sometimes we forget. It's almost like we're, we are that spoiled, rich kids that don't appreciate what we have here in America. Because when immigrants come, when I came to this country, I see nothing but opportunities. Even though I saw a lot of things that I didn't like, but I see some, nothing but opportunities. If you don't make it here, where are you going to make it? Bangladesh? Iraq? Iran? You know, South, South Africa, you're not. This is the place of opportunity. This is a land of, of freedom. A lot of us, we all came here for freedom. But let me ask you a question. Are you really free if you have to get up in the morning at a certain time, drive to work, you know, and, and work in a dead-end job or with people that you don't like, the job that you don't like, and then come back and drive back into traffic and rinse and repeat? Is that called freedom? To me, that's a death sentence. Oh, man, I couldn't agree with you more. I feel like uh, I was talking with my girlfriend uh, a few months ago, and it's almost like we have this really expensive, elaborate prison. Mm -hmm. And we're, every weekend we get recess, you know, we get, you know, time out. And, you know, Monday through Friday you go back. And when I started to realize that, I started to go say, okay, you know what, freedom and living the dream is really freedom of time, you know, and you've got to create that financial success in order to be able to do that. Um, and I know your passion for fitness is, is so immense that you decided to start the camp. Yeah, you know, so, you know, it all started with myself. It all started with myself, you know, and when I, when I started transforming my own body, my own mind, my own self-worth, you know, everything started, you know, you know, coming together for me. 
I knew that that's what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So while I was going to college, I was being a personal trainer. And I was the guy who was going to read in textbooks and come apply it to my clients. I will I'll go read an anatomy book and come apply it to my clients. You know, you know, same thing with the nutrition. When I went to grad school, I was, I was a personal trainer and I became a district uh, director of, of a big chain club where, where, and, and head their personal training. And then when I graduated, I gave my diploma to my mom and said, Mom, this is your dream for me. You, now you can call all your friends and brag that your son is a doctor. Now can I go open up my gyms? And that's what I did. You know, so I started my first gym here in Chino um, in, in 2000, in the year 2000. Before we jump down that entrepreneurial journey, because it's pretty exciting, um, a lot of people do have that struggle, though, where their parents want them to be something else. I myself, uh, similar, like, you know, I'm an orthodontist, right? And that was something, it was, to be successful, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer. I'm a doctor, my sister's a lawyer, right? And so it's like, that was what we were taught, but it's not easy to break out of that mold. And how were you able to, to do that? You know, to confidently go to your mom, like, here, you know what, I earned it, I did it, but now I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch. Because a lot of people are afraid of disappointing their parents. Well, I think, you know, you have to first realize one thing, that your parents want the best for you. You know, they just don't have the proper knowledge or they haven't adapted to the changing environment. You know, they say, as you get older, you will be more set in your ways. And I want you and I to remember when we have children, I have children already, but when you have children, remember that times have changed and you need to t change with times. You know, the principles are the same, but the vehicle changes. You know, what was worked before, you know, in, in the 1940s when there was an industrial age, doesn't work where today is an information age. You know, back then, you know, you know, if you wanted to do something and you didn't know how, you had to go to see a specialist. These days, you can pretty much learn surgery on YouTube. Right. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's crazy. You know, so, um, so they want the best for you, but you have to ultimately decide what makes you happy. You have to ultimately decide that what you want out of your life. And you have to explain that to them. And you know, at the end of the day, I always say this, your life is your show. And you're the director, and you decide what, how you want this show to go on. I like that a lot. You know, it's funny, my dad always said, uh, this is not a dress rehearsal for another life. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of tying that in with the show, just like, we gotta step up, and, and, and we gotta show up for our own life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you started your own training program uh, or business a little bit, but you got hit hard during the financial crisis in 2008. Yeah, so I started in 2000, and I didn't know anything about marketing, anything about business, anything about sales. All I did study is anatomy, physiology, nutrition, biochemistry. That's all I've studied and all I've done, not only in the classroom, but out of the classroom, become the first bodybuilder to have a first place title in every weight class. So. Um, Congrats, so, by the way. That was oh, really impressive. Yeah, it, it, was just, it was just crazy. I don't believe it myself. You know, I can't believe I went to from 143 pounds as a banner weight to a heavyweight at 200 pounds and won every single weight class. You know, um, but uh, because I learned how to manipulate my body for a certain look at a certain time. Um, but I was doing great, you know, um, you know, and then all of a sudden when I started, you know, you know, in 2005 when I retired from bodybuilding, I decided that, okay, well, gym business, now I gotta take it for real because I wanna retire from bodybuilding, I wanna get married, I wanna start a family. You know, I was happy making 10, 15 grand a month, you know, and, having, and, and be able to do my hobby, which was bodybuilding, you know, but now if I'm gonna get married, I'm gonna have children, I need to take this as a real business. So, and I knew that I didn't know anything about business, so I started getting mentoring and coaching and started, you know, going to seminars and reading marketing books and, and started my whole personal development journey. My whole personal development journey really started in 2005. Okay. You know what I mean? How old were you at that time? Um, I was 35. 35, okay, so I mean, just it, people kind of get confused about how long things take in life. I was 32, and, I'm sorry, 32. Yeah. So, but it's like, you know, 32 years old, and you've been working your ass off for this entire time of your life, whereas sometimes kids are, you know, 20, 25, and they expect it to happen now. And so I just was curious as for that, that was, at 32 years old, you're almost like recreating your life and stepping it up to that next level. Absolutely, there's always different levels, right? And you always have to understand in life, you are either growing or you're dying. You're either evolving or you're gonna be perishing. You know, so, um, so at that time I decided I wanna take this seriously and I started like, getting all this mentorship. I started blowing up my business, right? I started blowing up, in, in 2007, from a 3,500 square foot facility, I was doing over $2 million um, in gross revenue. But then the recession hit. 
and the recession hit, and, and, and I didn't want to believe recession. I was one of those positive thinkers. Oh, well, don't think about recession. People are just tripping about that. People, are, no, recession is real. You know, <laughs> you know, as, as much as positive thinking I was trying to do and, and trying to stay optimistic, recession can't hit me and I'm the man and you know, positive thinking. No, recession was real. Recession caked my ass. And because you know, I never knew about the ups and downs in the economy, I didn't have a father to teach me all that. And you know, when I started making good money, you know, obviously I should have probably spent it more wiser, you know, um, and, and, and I, you know, I, I wasn't reckless, but I wasn't wise, you know, and so when the recession hit, it completely wiped me out. I remember my house was getting foreclosure notices. Um, my ex-wife was pregnant with our first child, and now I'm looking at my bank account, I'm my negative $300. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm a loser. You know, I'm gonna bring this kid into the world. I have negative bank balance. What am I gonna do? You know, I'm gonna be just like the dad that, I, that never provided for me. And all those negative thoughts that, that, goes, that, that goes into play. From 2.4 million. To zero, to, to minus, zero. To minus $314. To minus $314 in two years. And then, you know, for, from, from a period of 2009 to 2014, it was literally one of the hardest five years of my life because, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna get back on top. I'm trying to figure out what am I gonna do. You know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally like, you know, you know, I'm working 18, 20 hour days. And every day I come home, I'm undefeated. Bills are piling up. I'm still getting calls from the, from, from, from the uh, mortgage company. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to save the house. You know, I have a small child. You know, I would come home and I would literally be sitting on the couch and I'd be a zombie, you know, because my mind was just trying to figure how I'm gonna get out of this messy situation. Were you still doing personal training? I was doing personal training. You know, I was doing personal training. I was trying to figure out different programs, different, different ways to be able to get more clients and different, different ways I can generate more revenue. You know, I started then started a mentorship program where I was teaching other gym owners what to do and, you know, and, 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 and how to thrive because they remember me as the seven figure Sam guy. Now that was my nickname in the fitness industry, you know, and, uh, but n nobody knew that the seven figure Sam is broke as fuck right now. Right. You, know I mean? <laughs> you know, you know, and I was just trying, you know, I, and I was trying to do my best to, to teach others what to do and no, more importantly, what not to do the mistakes that I made, yeah. you know, and um, in 2010, we opened up the Camp Transformation Center. You know, we decided, we figured out that, okay, people don't have, you know, six, $800 a month for personal training. Why don't we start a group training program where we can lower the cost for you know, for people to be able to join, but also for lower our costs as far as overhead is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to have all, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment. We don't need to have one personal trainer for every single client. We can have one trainer with 20 or 30 people. And, I, and so we, we took a chance at it. I invested my, you know, I had $11,000 left in my name. I invested 9,000 of it into that concept. Wow. And, uh, and that concept right now has 125 locations, an international franchise, and we did about uh, $38 million last year. Incredible. How, how did you stay so focused and committed through those years where, you know, that, that economy wrecked everybody? I mean, people lost everything, and people still haven't bounced back. I mean, my parents got hit so hard. They were in the real estate boom in Vegas, and they just got wiped well, Vegas out. Vegas got hit hard. And it's it's not easy to bounce back. I mean, I've seen so many people try, fail, not really be able to do it. How are you able to stay so focused? You know, what, what is the alternative? You know, I always tell people, people always say, how would you stay focused? What would you do this? What's the alternative? You know, you have two choices, right? When the life hits you, punches you in the mouth, you can either just stay focused and try to figure out a way out or just get knocked out and just give up. I mean, think about it, I feel like life is very similar to boxing. You know what I mean? You ever see a guy against a rope, you know, and the other guy's just wailing at him, just throwing punches and bunches, you know? And sometimes, if you know the guy is really good, he's just holding his composure, he's holding his composure, and he comes back and with a counter punch and knocks the other guy out, right? Yeah. Or if the guy, you know, doesn't hold his composure, he just wanna give up, he just takes a knee or gets knocked out on the ropes. So you have a choice. Do you want to get knocked out or do you want to weather the storm and make it come back? You know, my, um, my preacher, you know, Tim Story says, you know what, everybody has a setback, but don't sit in your setback because a setback is a God's way for you for a perfect comeback. 
You know what I mean? And you know, a lot of people have a setback and it is all oh, poor me because of this happened to me, this happened to me, because this happened to me, this happened to me. I could have, if I was gonna have a setback, I might as well just then blame my father for leaving us. Oh, because I didn't have a father, you know, you know, I can't get a job, I can't work, I can't do anything. You know, I didn't come all the way to America. You know, risk everything. You know, my mom coming here with five hundred dollars in luggage and, and it worked odd jobs and you know, living a project, getting food stamps. You know, I didn't come over here to be average. I didn't come over here to get knocked out. I came over here to win. You're doing it, man. I'm trying. You're doing it. And you know what? Life is gonna have its ups and downs. 100%. You know, it's not what I have now that I'm doing it. It's what I have become in the process. I love that. I just said that in the car the other day because of certain goals that I, I haven't accomplished or I have accomplished. And it's never, and it's hard to understand that money is not a big driver when you actually start to earn a lot of it. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I just need the money. I just need the money. Once you get that, you start to realize money was never what you really wanted. Maybe it was happiness or fulfillment or comfort even. 100%, 100%, I agree with you and I say that all the time. You know, you know, you're looking at an Lamborghini that I barely ever drive, you know, because I have a family. You know, I'm working most of the time and I have a family. What am I gonna do, put six, six people in here? I can't, so I drive my SUV or I, I drive my sedan or something like that. So even though I look back, I'm like, you know, this was like when I, when, you, when I was broke, I always told myself when I make it, I get the Lamborghini. I'm a car enthusiast, I love cars, don't get me wrong. But now I feel like it's just impractical. You know, and especially right now, 46 years old, it's hard to get in and out, get it in and out. I'm like, oh God, I gotta get out of this car. Like, you know, it kind of takes a little more, little more effort. I feel like I'm doing a squat. Yeah, these you know? are quality problems to have. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? You know, life is not about the Lambos and the mansions. Life is about growth and contribution. I always tell people this, you know, you know I can be in a, in a project, in, a, in, in just a 300 square foot, project, low income housing, but as long as I feel like I'm improving, I'm getting better, that makes me happy, you know? Or I can live in this mansion and I can get up every day and be the same. I won't be happy, I'll be depressed. So for me, if I can grow every day and if I feel like I'm contributing to society, that's what makes my heart happy, not money. Money just makes me, you know, not have issues and be able to pay my bills. Right. But once your basic necessities are met, which means that you have a roof over your house, you don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from, you have a reliable transportation, then anything after that is just luxury. And how much luxury do you wanna have? If I get a $100 million check tomorrow, my life, what, what, what am I gonna do? Get a bigger house? I mean, there's rooms that I haven't been into yet. You know, there, there's rooms that I, I'm like, oh, well, this room's pretty cool, you know? Or what am I gonna do? get more cars? What am I going to do? I don't, I don't you know, I, two of my cars are already in, in my in-law's house because I don't have the space for it. I have a five car garage. I have seven cars. What the hell? It's inspiring to see that, but also to see you put so much energy and effort into empowering other people and helping other people change their lives. Um, with, with the camp, I know that you guys can franchise that out. Like you're helping other business owners, you're helping people become fitness enthusiasts. You're helping them get more confidence. Mm -hmm. And that it's, it's hard for people to understand like when you start to strive for a goal bigger than yourself. Um, you, you talked about like building up the business and I wanna look at, you know, how did you create that success? Was, you know, the camps and um, different kind of group training sessions are definitely grown in popularity. You might've been a little bit early on that, but what were you guys doing when you're in the nitty gritty, when you're grinding every day? So you have to realize, man, I mean, everybody, you know, when it comes to fitness, you know, you know, America obviously have a weight problem. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, we, we, we were just talking about it with Dr. Saban Soleimani, who's a great, great friend of mine, who just is a world renowned, you know, you know, uh, you know, guy who does hormone optimization, weight loss and all that kind of stuff. And we're talking about like, in, you know, in the, in the 90s, they said, you know, fat was a culprit. You know, and then we found out that they took all the low fat thing, non fat thing, people got fatter. Then they said, you know what, in, in right now they're all the carbs are bad, right? And then we took the carbs away, you know, and then people got fatter. You know, right now there's this vegan thing going on. Everybody's, you know, the mother becoming vegan, oh, vegan this, vegan that. Guess what? Everybody's still getting fatter. So it's not carbs, it's not protein, you know, it's not fat. It's talking about just portion control and controlling yourself. So when it comes to weight loss, it's simple. Move more, eat better. Everybody has the recipe. 
But what they're missing is transformation. That's why we call it the Camp Transformation Center, not the Camp Boot Camp, not the Camp Personal Training, because that's a commodity. At the end of the day, what makes us different than any other species in the world, dogs, cats, tigers, elephants, you know, lions, is the fact that we want to transform. We want to be better than we were yesterday. We want to make better income. We want to have better relationships. We want to have better health. The tiger or a lion or a donkey doesn't get up every day and say, you know what, maybe I should go walk a little bit because I want to be healthy. And that's what we want to do. And that's what we differentiate ourselves from the competition because we talk about transformation. Now, if the methodology of exercise changes tomorrow, guess what? We don't have to change our name because it's not camp, boot camp. We're not going with a phase, oh, boot camps are hot. Oh, yoga is hot. Oh, Pilates is hot. Oh, cycling is hot. Oh, rowing is hot. The methodology is going to change. Just look at the pattern of fitness. Oh, there's one minute something's hot, one minute is hot, and then they make, it a, make a comeback. Then they make a comeback, right? Transformation is always here. As, as long as we're humans, we always want to better ourselves and become a better version of ourselves. And that kind of led into not just transforming other people, but transforming yourself and that one percenter mindset and the ideology behind that. Can you tell us like, what you mean? What do you think a one percenter is and how they live that? So one percenter, a lot of people mistake. Oh, you're a one percenter, you're better than me. Oh, you're trying to think you're better than me. No, it's not about being better than anyone. One percenter is about making your own path. One percenter is about you becoming the best version of yourself. Your one percenter is all about not giving a fuck about what everybody else is doing and trying to be popular, you know, sticking to what you have to do. One percenter is about delaying gratification where everybody else is, is, you know, have goals, but they don't, you know, follow through with them. You have your goals and you delay gratification and you go after your goals. One percent. I mean, Warren Buffett said that if you want to be successful, look at what 99% of people do and do the opposite. Let's face it, 99% of people are fat and broke. And 50% of people are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. I just learned that right now, today. It's crazy to me because people go, you know, how, how do I do it? How do I change my life? And I'm like, diet plans, all you got to do is Google it. You don't know how to save money, you just save it. And it's like, it's not necessarily how to do it, but it's what's inspiring them to create that change. What do you tell people when they give you those excuses? How do you inspire them to want to change? You know, changes come from daily habits. You know, so what you have to do is you have to plan and you have to break down that to your plan to monthly goals, weekly goals, daily goals, and hourly things that gets you towards that, towards that goal. So whatever that is, look, in life, everything that you do, it gets you closer to your goals or more away from your goals. So as long as you always remember what you're working towards, what is your top priority? Because when you know what your top priorities are, when you are crystal clear in what you want out of life, decision making becomes really easy. It's really easy. Oh, will this get me closer to my goal or more away from goal? If this meal is going to get me closer to my goal or away from goal, will this shoes get me closer to my goal or more away from my goal? It's really simple. So until you become crystal clear of what you want out of life, then you're going to be lost. And I think a lot of people, they always forget to write it down. You know, I was just reading a study and rereading a study where it's 42, you're 42 percent more likely to accomplish your goals if you just write it down. I would say you're 99 percent more likely because <laughs> I can't tell you how important that is in that. Because what does it do when you write your goals and you read your goals every day? It automatically, you know, programs your subconscious towards that goal. I can't tell you. I can tell you freaky, freaky stories about me reading goals, me thinking about something and just manifesting itself. I don't want to get all, you know, metaphysical on this. On, on, on this podcast, but it's true. It's true. How hard is it for you to write five or 10 things you want out of life or five things that you go and just get up and read it? It's going to take you 30 seconds. But you know what Jim Rohn said? What's easy to do is easier not to do. <laughs> I tell you, it's funny. I, I don't always look at my goals necessarily on a daily basis, but if I'm ever confused, I always write down goals. But I love looking back at some journal notes and that I've written down, seeing the goal that I want. And the thing is, I obsessively think about my goals, so I know exactly what they are. I wake up in the morning, I, I, I think about the top three goals that I want every single day. And when I look back and I see something, I say, wow, I can't believe I accomplished that. Mm -hmm. And it, you're right, and not to get metaphysical, but when our subconscious mind says, we want something, we're gonna focus on it. It's like, if I want that car, I'm gonna start seeing Lamborghinis all over the yeah. place, even though they're not all over the place, but like you're like, 
did some of the, everybody suddenly start buying yeah. Lamborghinis? No, you're aware of it. Exactly. Um, speaking of daily habits, though, I know you, you wake up at like 4 a.m. in the 3 morning. 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Yeah. You work out at 4 a.m. Yeah, work out at 4 a.m. What what does your daily morning look like? Like, what are the empowering habits you have? So it's very simple, man. My daily mo- routine starts the night before. Okay. Nice. You know, you can't you can't start the daily routine and try to figure out what you're gonna do. You gotta get as soon as you get up. You know, you gotta have the plan in front of you. You can't kind of wonder, oh well, today let me let me figure out what I'm gonna do today. You already lost a half a day right there. So what I like to do, you know, the night before, I want to scan what my schedule is gonna look like. I actually print out my schedule. I don't have it on my phone. I have it on my phone, but I don't look at my phone. Because what happens when you look at your phone? You get distracted. As a notification comes on, next you know, you know, you know. I want to look at bird's eye view the whole time, what I have coming up next. So I print out my schedule, you know, the night before. And I want to make sure that my schedule is filled up. And every time my schedule is not filled up, I'm, I put up with the activities that are congruent to my goals. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, so whatever my goals are, those, those spots that are open is working towards the goals that I have written down, you know? So I, I you know, I print out my uh, schedule the night before. I put out my clothes for the next day. Last thing I want to do at three o'clock in the morning in the dark is trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to wear. You know what I mean? I'm trying, you know, so I, I put my clothes, my workout clothes, and what I'm going to work if I'm going to go to the office that day, what I'm going to wear that day. You know, believe it or not, I have a liter of, you know, water right there at the stand waiting for me. So what I, I, I drink, you know, a liter of water as soon as I get up, you know, put on my, put on my clothes, you know, and I read my goals. I read my goals. There's one thing I've been doing recently that that's, I think is profound, and I think everyone should that. Not only that I've, re- you know, I have actually recorded me t- saying each one of my goals. Like if I have 10 goals, I, I have a sentence for each goal, right? So now when I'm reading my goals, I'm also listening to it at the same time. You play it back to yourself. I'm playing it back to myself. It's, it's, it's in my recorder. So I loop it back, I loop it back, I loop it back. Because I feel like I'm only reading it and I'm listening to it. It's so profound. It's, it's something about your own voice. You hearing your goal in your own voice. And I love that. So once I, I read that, I'm ready. But that time, you know, if I'm taking a pre-workout or I'm taking a, you know, a little coffee or taking a little caffeine pill, by that time that's kicked in, I'm ready to take on the world. So I go to the gym, you know, I work out from 4 to about 5.30 come home, take a shower, eat a nice healthy breakfast, say my prayers, take my vitamins, now I'm ready for the world. That's awesome. I, I think it is so critical to start off. I love the fact that you do it the night before. And every time I've done that, you always wake up and go. You don't even think about it. Such a powerful strategy. When you've been building this business, and I think you said 36 million, right? This Yeah, we did about 39 million. 39 sorry. million. Yeah, 30, okay, yeah. yeah. Last year, that's how we're, we're projected to do more this year. So hopefully, you know, we're hitting the forties. Just incredible, man. How have you been able to continue this massive growth? You know, growth just comes from consistency. Now there's times that you're going to have what I call exponential growth, right? Like the rocket, right? But there's going to be times, just like, you know, when you work out your plateaus, right? You know, you don't all of a sudden, you know, you know, lose 10 pounds every week. You might, you know, lose 10 pounds one week or when you first begin, or you might actually get some great, you know, great, you know, muscle definition after a few weeks, but it's not going to be like that all the time. So you have to be prepared for the times of plateaus, right? You know, when you have to rock it, you have to plateau. We've hit many, many plateaus, but as long as you hit consistent, you stay consistent and you're always trying to figure out how, how you can improve, what can you change you know are willing to to try and experiment and fail mm. then you're going to get you're going to find the next exponential growth the problem is that most most businesses you know they hit you know they, they go like a rocket they hit a plateau and then they don't want to experiment they don't want to try different things they kind of like want to do the same old play and expect different results kind of like what we do when we work out you know, when we work out, you know, if something's not working, then why keep doing the same workout? Why keep the same diet? If something's not working, if you plateau something, you have to change the variables. And a lot of times we don't, we're not willing to experiment. We're not willing to take a chance and then we die. You know, it's funny because a lot of entrepreneurs want to be successful. And I mean, this podcast is called Unleash Success, but I really think it's what you do when you fail. And you 100%. talk, you talk, yeah, and you talk about failures, and you've you've grinded it out since two thousand eight. What what is your viewpoint of failure? I mean, I imagine you still hit failure spots from time to time. How do you view it, and how do you pick yourself back up and keep going forward? Failure are necessary prerequisite 
to success. Nobody in life became successful and was undefeated. Nobody. I mean, what did they say? Thomas Edison tried 10,000 times. Is that what, what they say? I don't know the exact number, right. but something yeah. like that. You know, how many times their Wright brothers, you know, crashed the damn plane before, before they, they had one going. How many times, you know, you know, you know uh, Henry Ford, you know, you know, failed at making the car. So if you look at history and look at success, you know, there's no such a thing as failure. These are all learning lessons. Just because something didn't work out at the time that you wanted to work out, that's not failure. You just find out one way that it didn't work, it actually now you know what not to do. Sometimes knowing what not to do is so much more important than knowing what to do. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about what people should do, the daily habits, the mindset, you know, building a business and how to grind it out. But what, what should people be avoiding? What should people be not doing? Well, I mean, like I said, the great Warren Buffett, he said, look at around you. Let's take a look around you. You know, don't be like everybody else. God didn't put you here as a copy. Don't copy people. You know what I mean? You know, you know, don't, you, know you were born an original. Why do you want to die a copy? <laughs> you know? People are always looking at what other people are doing. Oh, look, this person has the new Louis Vuitton bag. Let me go get the Louis, Louis, Louis Vuitton bag. Oh, this person has, if you want to get a Louis Vuitton bag, by all means, get the Louis Vuitton bag, but don't get it because everybody else is doing it. You know, if you want to do, make your own path, be yourself. Don't try to be like, when you start adhering to what society wants you to be, then you just become washed up with a pool of other people. You need to be unique. And so as you've built your your personal brand and the One Percenter podcast, how do you establish your own uniqueness? What do you think separates you from everybody else? My story. You know, you know everybody has a unique story. A lot of times I was, I was just texting, you know, a, a girl that's going to come on a podcast and she told me, Sam, I don't know if you want me to talk about this on the podcast because, you know, you know, you know, I'm, I'm really messed up in the head. You know, my my dad cheated on my mom. You know, I was molested. You know, I, I you know, I, I did, you know, did, you know, this happened and that happened and that happened. I'm like, look, that's your story. You got to own it. A lot of people run away from who they really are, you know, and, you know, being born in a Middle Eastern family, you know, they, you know, the Middle Eastern families, they don't talk about their losses. All they talk about is their wins. They never admit losses. And to me, that's so stupid. Because like I said, losses are failures and failures are, are learning points. I don't wanna you know, know about all your wins. Tell me all the times that you fucked up. Tell me all the times that you messed up. That's what I'm more interested about because that's what I will learn from. Right. You know what I mean? And a lot of times, man, where people with their, with, with their own brands, they're not being, being true to who they really are. Just be you, just be, you know, your story. Don't hide anything from your stories. You know, if you, you know, if you go on my website, you know, I used to be the guy, well, oh, I can't say this because I, I, you know, I don't, people would think of me of this and oh, people, who cares? You know, people are not paying your bills. You gotta be you. No matter what you do, somebody's not gonna approve of you. Jesus didn't have 100% approval rating, neither did Muhammad, neither did Moses, and neither does God. If God doesn't have 100% approval rating, me and you sure as hell are not going to get that. So be you, be original, and forget about what other people think. Because your story is unique. That's what makes you original, and that's your story is your brand. It's so true. I just think that people, I mean, I understand that you want to own up to your story. But a lot of people are afraid of talking about themselves, or they, they've got this fear. And whether it's creating a personal brand, building a business, losing weight, they all have these fears that they face. How do, you, how do you overcome your own fears as you've continued to grow and help other people do that? Look, to me, fear, you know what it stands for. You know what it stands for. False evidence appearing yeah. real. Yeah, appearing real, right? I've got one that was, that was like, face everything and rise, false, yeah. yeah. You know, you know at, at the end of the day, how many times were you fearful? I mean, think about it, you know, you know, your, your beautiful, you know, girlfriend is here, right? Let's just say, let's just say that, you know, you know, do you remember the first time you guys met? Did you ask her out? How did oh, you ask man. her out? man. Put me on blast. You're going to wait, you're going to wait for it. Because technically she was the first one who approached me. Damn, she oh, loves, right. I know, she loves that. You know, well, when Same. you see something you like, right? No. <laughs> no okay, so, 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 so the question, so the question I did ask her. her out though. You know, but, but the yeah. question, when, when, if she wouldn't have approached you, 
she would have lost the opportunity to be with you, mm -hmm. right? So in the beginning, you know, when she approached you, just like anybody else, just like when you approach anyone or we have ever approached anyone in the past, you know, you have that, that, you have that fear of being rejected, mm -hmm. right? What's the worst thing that can happen? You know, always remember, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, in anything you do in life, you have to analyze this. What's the worst thing that can happen? What's the best thing that can happen? If the best thing that can happen is a lot better than the worst thing that can happen, then it's a clear choice, yeah. right? So, you know, when you have fear, ask yourself, what's the fucking worst thing that can happen? It couldn't be worse than the bombing. It couldn't be worse than me getting bullied and beat up. It couldn't be worse than me being a preteen and, and coming to this country. It couldn't be worse than all the things that I went through in life. So why not go fucking for it? You know, you've been here this long, you might as well find out. A hundred percent agree. You know what? Just off that story, because we were re recently retelling how we met and I didn't even remember this part, but she did that apparently like after we met, you know, she invited me to that seminar, right? And, and the odds of me being at that seminar were pretty much zero. I happened to have hurt myself. So I wasn't playing some intramural sports, decided to go to the seminar, meet her there. And she says, you know, do you want to sit with me? So we go to lunch, but like, I never got her number. And as we're leaving the seminar, I guess I ran after her, right? And asked her for a number and then the rest is history. But the truth is, I was like, man, if I hadn't been there, she hadn't spoke up to me or if I had just let her, I would never have even found her again if I didn't ask for a number. Here we are four years later, so. See, that damn seminar did everything. I have, yeah. a, I have a very similar story with my wife, you know, very similar story. And, and, it's, and, it, and it's just a, a metaphor to life. Metaphor for life. In life, you have to take chances. As long as it's not reckless, dumb chances. Not like you, you know, it's not like you jump out of an airplane without a parachute. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. You know, I'm not talking about those chances. I'm talking about calculated chances. You always say, what's the best scenario? What's the worst scenario? If the worst scenario is something that is not going to kill you, then fucking go for it. Absolutely. Um, so a lot of times on this podcast, I talk about the 80-20 rule. I'm sure you know that's from Pareto Principle. Yeah. Uh, and the way I use it is that 80% of results come from 20% of reactions. And it could be 99-1, it could be 95-5. Yeah, yeah. um, we've talked a lot about mindset and, and building a business and, and creating success. For you, what do you recommend to people is, is the number one action? I mean, if, if you said it already, that's fine. Just one thing that they could do today to significantly improve their life. Okay, for, like I said, I'm a firm believer to write down crystal, be crystal clear of what you want your life to be like. What are your goals? What is your life? What, what's, what's, be crystal clear. Once you have the crystal clarity of exactly what you want your life to be, then you set goals and then you reverse engineer your goals to daily habits to get you there. It's really that simple. But until you are crystal clear of what you want, you know, you know it's, that's not going to happen. So that needs to happen. Look, here's what I'm saying all the time. Here's what I always tell people. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you have done. All that matters right now is where you are, where you're willing to go, and the price you're willing to fucking pay for it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, my mom always said, if you want to be here, you can, as long as you're willing to work hard and pay the price. Most people want to be here but don't want to pay the price. Most people are not willing to stay consistent. You know Andy Frisillo has that 75 hard program, right? Yeah. 75 hard. Oh, 75 hard, 75 hard, 75 hard. People running around like jackasses. Everybody, 75 hard, I'm gonna do it. 99% of people can stay consistent for 75 fucking days. It's crazy. You know, 75 days out of your life, they commit to something, 20 days into it, five days into it, 20, you know, 50 days into it, dude. If you just be relentless and consistent over what you want to do over time, shit is going to happen. I guarantee you that. Uh, I mean, obviously, you've been the embodiment of that. Coming here in 1985, building a business in 2005, going to 2.4 million, and then back down to zero, back up to 39, 40 million dollars a now, year. The perfect example was just the bodybuilding. Bro, I had the worst genetics. The only thing I had was my calves, but my mom gave me calves. But, you know, my, I had skinny arms, skinny upper body, a big fat belly. 
You know, I have pictures of you showing I got a big old tummy and little ass arms and little ass chest. When I said I was going to be a bodybuilder, everybody laughed. Oh, you don't got the genetics. It's not. I worked out for two or three years. People laughed. They're like, you know what? You know, after two or three years, I thought I had something going on, but we can't even tell you work out. I remember clearly, you know, people said you can't even work out, you know, but you know what? Guess what? I just showed up every day. I just showed up every day. I just showed up every day. I just worked out every day. I didn't become, you know, you know, I, I became obsessed with the process. I showed, I became upset. I showed up every day. I had my work routine. Today, I'm doing the same routine I did 30 years ago. I, I, I found my first bodybuilding book that I wrote, all my workout program. Guess what? It's the same fucking workout. Over done over 30 years, it became, it made me the bodybuilding champion that I am. So I didn't become an overnight. It, it didn't happen over time. It just happened from consistency. And life is all about that. You want to be a millionaire? It's, it's consistency. You want to blow up your business? It's consistency. Because you know what? It's going to go like this. It's going to like this. It's going to plateau. But if you stay with it, you're going to break it. So what do you rely on though if like you wake up one morning and you're having an off day? I have, I have an off day at least once a week. Okay, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have imagined that from this interview just like. So I'm, 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 look, I'm not a broccoli eating cyborg. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you know everybody thinks, oh, Sam is just a robot. Sam is a robot. Bro, I'm 46 years old, you know, especially right now when, when it's all, you know, it's cold outside right now, it's, it's dark outside. You know, I got all these, you know, I got severe, severe arthritis on my left shoulder, you know, from years of pounding the weights. You know, my, my knees, you know, hurt. I get up in the morning, I got aches and pains and I don't want to go, go through Thing. But you know what? I learned one thing. It's not about how I feel. It's about my goal. See, people make goals and then they go by their feelings. Well, let me see how I feel in the morning. Then I fucking decide. If you run your life based on feelings, you're not going to get anywhere. Because if I, you know, there's days that I have that might, you know, I have a bad back, bad shoulder. I don't feel like it. I had two hours of sleep. But if you learn to show up, if I have an off day, I still go to the gym. I might not be able to be a beast in the gym, but I'm gonna do something. I might go at 20, 30%. You know, today, you know, I went upstairs, you know, my, you know, my home gym, and I did from just lightweight, and I did 30 minutes of walking. I feel 100 times better. Did, did I crush my workout? No, I didn't crush my workout, but it was a great workout, and I feel great. So, you know what? You don't have to win every single battle in life, mm -hmm. but you have to understand what it takes for you to win the war. Right. And to me, there is nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, worse than letting yourself down. Man, uh, very wise. Um, there is a quote that I, I kind of wanted to wrap this up. You've achieved so much, um, but I, I think I saw this on your website and something that, uh, a quote that changed my life um, when I was at a, a Tony Robbins seminar, mm -hmm. and that is, success without fulfillment my is favorite the quote. ultimate failure. My favorite quote. You know, you know I, I'm going to you know, tell you about that quote. When I first heard that, I was broke. I got served with divorce papers, and I was one of my darkest points of my life. And I couldn't understand what that meant. Because I'm like, what do you mean success without fulfillment is ultimate goal? Because you know what? I can't even think about fulfillment. I could have, my house is being foreclosed on. I, did, you know, I, I just got served with divorce papers. My whole life is crashing down, right? But then once I achieved the baseline, and what I mean by the best ba uh, baseline is that now I'm not rich as fuck, but I'm comfortable. You know, my house is paid for, my cars are paid for, you know, I don't have to worry about my next month's coming up, you know, so my basic necessities are met. Then I thought about it, like we talked about earlier in the podcast. Now what's next? What's next? You know, I don't need a bigger house. I don't need more cars. I don't need more clothes. Jesus Christ. You know, I have 300 pairs of shoes that I probably, I probably wear the same fucking one. My wife makes fun of me. You know, it's like, that's an old man's shoes. I don't care. You know, it, it, you, know I'm, you get to the point I never thought, you know, you ever grow up, I saw a rich dude just wearing basic shit or driving basic shit. And at that moment, when you're young, when you, when you haven't made that level, you don't understand, like, dude, Jesus Christ, your shoes look like they're 10 years old. Won't you get you, I know you can afford new Nikes, and what's that uh, with a big, big old uh, beat up pickup truck? Won't you get yourself a nice car or something? I know you're a millionaire, right? But at that time, you don't realize much. The dude don't give a fuck. He's already achieved this. The full, you know, he already achieved the top. Now he just wants to, he just wants to be fulfilled. That, you know, so 
once you get there, it's hard to understand. And that success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. It's hard to understand when you're into the thing. But first, get you in a place where you can understand that. Once you understand that quote, it's the greatest thing in life. It was a game changer for me as well. I just, it was, it was hit the nail on the head and I never even thought about fulfillment. Kind of, you know, I was just like, I've got a goal, 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 goal. And all I did was go. And then all of a sudden I was like, is this what I really want? Is this making me happy? Am I doing something to empower other people? Yeah. And um, when I read that, I was like, man, this is going to be a great interview. Yeah. <laughs> and it sure has been. Yeah. It sure has been. Um, so can you tell everybody where we can find you online? Yeah, so my, my name is Sam, S-A-M. Last name is Bakhtiar, B-A-K-H-T-I-A-R. So if you Google my name on my website, Instagram, and all that kind of stuff, you know, pops up. You know, I'm, I, I, um, you know I reply to all my DMs. That's, I, that's one of the things that I loved about you was when I, I reached out to you, I started following you and I was like, I was really inspired and um, saw the one percenter podcast and was like, hey, and when I reached out, I, I couldn't believe how uh, humble, uh, honestly, like you seemed, you just were like, gave me the time of day, were super nice and you even said it would be an honor to be on this podcast and I'm like sitting there going, man, this guy is awesome and I really appreciate that. Um, you have clearly been so driven to achieve a lot of different success in every area of life. You know, family, finances, I know you got the five Fs yes. and faith and you know, all those things that you do. But I always believe there's a next level and I think that you agree with your pursuit of growth and, and fulfillment. Um, for you, what is that next level of success? Like I said, right now, my next level of success will be more personal growth, which will lead to my children's personal growth. See, you know, I think that children are the biggest blessing in life. You know, nothing makes you realize what life is all about till you have children. You know, before I had children, you know, I was the most selfish, self-centered person in the world because I was the only child. You know, I never, ha never had a roommate. I never had siblings. I never had to share anything. Even in college, I had my own little studio apartment. I didn't go to dorms or I didn't share, you know, I didn't share apartments or anything like that. You know, I got out of college, started making money. I was a bodybuilder. So bodybuilding is a selfish sport. It's not a team sport. You know, it's you, you know, what time you live, what time you eat, what time you tan, what time you pose, you know? So, you know, it was all about me, you know? But once, I never, never forget the, the day that I saw you know, my, my little girl, my, my, my firstborn at a 3D ultrasound. I looked at it, man. I mean, I was just like, wow, you know, um, you know, I, I got to do something. First thing I did was sell, sell my motorcycle, you know what I mean? Because I'm like, I don't want, you know, you know to die, you yeah. know? And this, the, the second thing I did was get life insurance, you know? You know and I, so, so what I want to achieve now is to be able to grow, you know, to grow other people grow my children, grow my family, and contribute, contribute to society. Just like you said, you know, contribution and growth leads to fulfillment. You know, I don't need more cars. I don't need more homes. I don't need more shoes. You know, I wear the same shit every day anyway. So <laughs> I drive the same car anyway. So that was, the, that was just the, you know, the thing that when I was coming up, I thought I wanted. Yeah. And I'll share one thing with you. It's funny because you get, talk about the Lambo, just materialistic thing. I had this vision of success as a kid. And uh, for some reason, uh, it was a cherry red Ferrari. And I'm like, I don't even know why I want that. But if even today, it still is this one thing that I'm like, if I make millions and millions of dollars and I can afford that, because I, I, the only reason I would buy that is to say, I am so set for life. My children's children are set for life. Um, and it's funny because you, you talk about, you've got all this stuff and you talk about your legacy and providing for all your kids and your kids' kids. Um, it's really, really powerful and, and a strong driving force. I always say, if your why doesn't make you cry, it's not strong enough. I like that. Sam, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. Right. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for having me. If you guys enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that we have is please go subscribe.